I was raised to believe that the Bible is a book of morals, that it defines good versus evil for us within its pages. In the Garden of Eden, however, there were two trees. The tree that brought death was the tree that contained the question of morals, good versus evil. The other tree was the tree that brought life to all the aid of its fruit, the tree of life. Is it possible that we've been asking the wrong questions, chasing the wrong thing by seeking to be moral? Let's run an experiment. Rather than seeking to define and live by good versus evil, let's flip the question. Let's define life instead. But to do that, we must first seek it out. So join us as we dare Shkai, as we seek life. Hey everybody, Aaron from Dare Shkai here again. We are here for episode four. We are finishing up this series on images that began back in Genesis 1. So today we are in Genesis 5. And as I said last week, we're going to kind of pick up some of Genesis 4 in this discussion because it goes from Genesis 5 and this actually goes into Genesis 6 through verse 8. So we're going to kind of go back and go forward a little bit around Genesis 5. So the past few episodes, we've looked at the ways to look at Scripture. We've added some very useful tools to our toolbox, things that we can really use in the future to try to discern the things of Scripture, to figure out what it is that Scripture is trying to affirm. In episode one, we looked at using repetition of words as a pointer to what it is that we should be paying attention to in the text. Episode two, we looked at the use and the interconnectedness of metaphors and how these little stories, these little phrases, these little ideas can expand a whole world of meaning into a single word or single idea that can then just be put in, such as Gardner. And when we see Gardner, suddenly this whole slew of ideas are all connected to that idea of someone gardening in a garden. We also looked at word trains, using words in succession to help us to recognize when a specific thing is going on. And we actually used that last week as we were building the puzzle, as we were taking the various pieces and putting them together, examining them, figuring them out, to figure out where it is, what it is that's missing from the picture. And then once we understood what was missing from the picture, we could then figure out how we could fill that in using our own experience. In this episode, we're going to go one step further with all of that. Unfortunately, Genesis 5 is simply a genealogy. And Genesis 6, 1 through 8, provides some of the most sensationalized material in the Bible. So it goes from boring to Mach 2 in no time flat. It's the fastest takeoff you've ever seen. So how do we handle this? How do we make connections in the text when this seems to happen? When there's nothing bore, 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 bore. Ooh, Nephilim! Let's latch onto that idea and try to build that into some huge doctrinal thing. How do we pull meaning from that rapid shift? One way we could do it is we could ignore the boring and look only to the sensational. Just dive in headfirst to that sensationalized stuff and use that as our meat. I don't want to ignore chapter 5 because it has something really important to say. And I think what we're going to do today will kind of help us to understand one of the ways that genealogy can be used to speak to us. The usual way of handling it is to go to the sensational stuff to try to figure that out. But I'm not interested in sensational. I'm interested in finding life. In my opinion, the Nephilim chasers out there are doing very little to bring life to the conversation. They're doing very little to bring life into the world. All they have is speculation. And that speculation usually leads to fear. Because you got to ask yourself, where in my life do Nephilim, do giants have an effect What if there still are Nephilim today? Does it in any way affect my life here and now in this modern world? Might it someday? Sure. If that's the case, then we can go back and visit the question of Nephilim. But for now, it has no bearing on me. It has no bearing on my life. Uh, So let's not really focus on it. So without the sensational, what are we left with? Well, that's where these tools come in handy. The method that I'm about to talk about is one that, over time, as you 
begin the practice of meditation, as we talked about last week. That process of being aware of what's in the text and asking questions to the text and just sitting there and muttering it and mulling it over. It's something that would naturally occur. It would become our second nature when we approach the text. Rather than waiting for that to be developed, we're going to take a shortcut. And we're going to do that by using a metaphor. That's one of the awesome things about metaphors is they can be used to shortcut disparate ideas and help us to make connections that might take time otherwise to arrive at. So one of the things we have to recognize, we have to realize, is that when we read text, the human mind shifts its expectations of what it's going to find. So if you open a book of poetry, you kind of have an idea that what you're going to be looking at is mostly metaphor. And we know for a fact that reading poetry book, reading a book of Robert Frost, is completely and utterly different than reading a textbook on poetry, right? Two completely different experiences, even though they have the same subject. The same thing with fiction and technical manuals. You can read a fiction story about someone in a jet plane and then read a technical manual about that same plane. Two completely different styles of writing, two different things that you expect to get from the text. And I think that we can learn from that. Biography and history in the same way. In biography, you get the story of someone's life. In history, you get the events of someone's life. Two different things. Two very similar genres. But as you open the text, if you know what you're getting into, then you at least have some idea of what to expect from the text. And I think that we can use this to our advantage when we open the pages of Scripture. Because there's a way of reading Scripture that can help to induce the process of asking questions to the text. We can open scripture with a certain assumption or idea of what's in its pages. And that can help us to get to the message beneath the text, the thing that it's really trying to affirm. So to get to what's beneath, we have to ask questions to the text, right? Now, what I'm about to say, I hesitate to say it, but I've said controversial things before that could be completely misconstrued. So I'm going to say it. But please hear me out on this. It's a metaphor. It's not what I expect the reality of the text is. Does that make sense? So, I think one of the best ways that we can get ourselves to start asking questions to the text is to approach the text as if it were a novel. Now, I'm not saying that it's fiction. I'm not saying that it's a novel. Please hear me. However, when we open a novel, especially a good novel, we understand that in the text, the author is exploring topics that aren't necessarily the story that's happening, that the author is also trying to elicit a response within us using the words on the page. A good novel, every word Every scene, every character, everything that occurs in that novel has a purpose. And that purpose is to progress the story towards its end point, towards its climax. That purpose is to get the reader to consider consequences, to consider philosophical ideas, to consider situations where they normally wouldn't find themselves in, but to then think on those things and contemplate how would I react in that situation? How would I react if, you know, whatever novel you want to go to? And so I think that there is a specific type of novel, one that we can use as a really good example of this. And those are the novels of Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. In a Sherlock Holmes story, everything matters. And there's absolutely nothing out of place. Those things that may seem innocuous, those things that may seem just simply descriptive, if we have read a Sherlock Holmes novel, if we understand how Sherlock Holmes works, we'll know there's absolutely nothing out of place in a Sherlock Holmes novel. Everything there is important. And hidden in all of that is the solution. Because you always get the solution before Sherlock gets to it. You just have to connect the pieces. How does Sherlock do that? He's aware. And he asks questions. Perhaps another way of stating this, that in a novel, in a story, that everything should have a place and that we should expect everything that's mentioned to be pertinent, was stated by the Russian playwright Anton Chekhov. 
He has a famous saying, something I learned when I was in literature classes in high school. He says that if there is a rifle hanging over the mantle in Act 1, that rifle will be fired by Act 3. The point of that being that authors shouldn't include things into the story that are meaningless. They shouldn't include things that don't advance the plot. That you really shouldn't have anything misplaced. Descriptive coincidence shouldn't exist. Everything within it should progress the story. So what is our role when we approach scripture? We are Sherlock Holmes. So grab your magnifying glass and put on your little hat. I don't know what kind it is. Sorry. And let's act like Sherlock Holmes. Let's look for clues. Let's start asking questions and see if perhaps through being overly aware and asking the right questions, we might arrive at something highly useful. So let's read this week's text and then give that a practice. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis 5. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that Elohim created man, he made him in the likeness of Elohim. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them, and called their name Adam in the very day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and brought forth a son in his own likeness after his image, and he called his name Shet. And after he brought forth Shet, in the days of Adam were 800 years, and he brought forth sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And Shet lived 105 years and brought forth Enosh. And after he brought forth Enosh, Shet lived 807 years and brought forth sons and daughters. So all the days of Shet were 912 years, and he died. And Enosh lived 90 years and brought forth Canaan. And after he brought forth Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years and brought forth sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. And Canaan lived 70 years and brought forth Mahalalel. And after he brought forth Mahalalel, Canaan lived 840 years and brought forth sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. And Mahalalel lived 65 years and brought forth Yered. And after he brought forth Yered, Mahalalel lived 830 years and brought forth sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. And Yered lived 162 years and brought forth Chenoch. And after he brought forth Chenoch, Yered lived 800 years and brought forth sons and daughters. So all the days of Yered were 962 years, and he died. And Chenoch lived 65 years and brought forth Methuselah. And after he brought forth Methuselah, Hanach walked with Elohim 300 years and brought forth sons and daughters. And all the days of Hanach were 365 years. And Hanach walked with Elohim when he was no more, for Elohim took him. And Methuselah lived 187 years, and he brought forth Lemech. And after he brought forth Lemech, Methuselah lived 782 years and brought forth sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. And Lemech lived 182 years and brought forth a son, and called his name Noach, saying, This one does comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands, because the ground which Hashem has cursed. And after he brought forth Noach, Lemech lived 595 years and brought forth sons and daughters. So all the days of Lemech were 777 years, and he died. And Noach was 500 years old, and Noach brought forth Shem, Chem, and Yafet. And it came to be, when men began to increase on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of men, that they were good, and they took wives for themselves and all whom they chose. And Hashem said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. In his going astray, he is flesh, and his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of Elohim came to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, the men of name. And Hashem saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And Hashem was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And Hashem said, I am going to wipe off man whom I have created from the face of the ground, both man and beast, creeping creature, and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of Hashem. 
All right, so like I said, 20 miles an hour to Mach 2 and no time flat. So the typically boring passage that we started in, what clues can we look for in that passage to assist us in trying to make heads or tails of what's going on? Verse 1 gives us a thread. Okay, so we're going to start looking for clues. And verse 1 gives us one of those clues, a thread that we can begin to pull on. And it says that in the day that God created man, what have we learned previously? If we see something that's repeated from somewhere previous, we need to go back to that place. So in the day that God created Adam, where was that? Genesis 1, right? So well, let's recognize there is a clue pointing us back to Genesis 1. It then continues on. He made him in the likeness of God. Again, another pointer back to Genesis. Man was created in the image of God, right? But it uses the word likeness here in many translations. If we go to the Hebrew, we will look for that word, and we will find that in Genesis 1, the word image is different than the word likeness in this chapter. Does it mean anything? Well, let's consider it and find out. So in Genesis 1, the word used as tselem. It's something that's used for idols, for images. Tselem is what Rachel stole from her father Laban later on in Genesis. They're the little household idols. And they were just an image of something else, kind of like a metaphor. The word that's used here, however, is demut. If we look to how demut is used and where it's derived from, we come to understand that it's more of just a model of something. It's not an image, it's a model. How are they different? And they're not really. The word demut figuratively takes on the idea of a likeness or similitude. Something that's similar, not exact. So we've got these few pointers back to Genesis 1. That second one's kind of tentative. Likeness, image, can we draw a solid connection? Not yet. So let's continue on. Verse 2, male and female, he created them, and he blessed them, and called their name Adam. Okay, so we're back to Genesis 1 again. Male and female, he created them, straight from Genesis 1. And then he blessed them, again, straight from Genesis 1. It's repeating Genesis 1 here. There's something there it wants us to see here. And he called their name Adam. That's nearly an exact repeat. And then verse 3, it says, And Adam brought forth a son, a son in his own Likeness, again, that's the word demut, his own model, his own similitude. After his image, there's the word selim from Genesis 1. So we have now a very solid connection with Genesis 1, specifically to the idea of images, which is really what this entire four-episode series has been dealing with, is images. And so we have demut and selim linked as words that mean very, very similar things. They're synonyms. Slightly different connotations in each, just as in English. The two synonyms can have a slightly different connotation to them. Then it begins to start listing all of these generations that proceed from Adam. And as we read through the following generations, there's a lot of repetition, but there's something that's not repeated. Something that we don't see again, and that is created in his image or in his likeness. Only one that was created in the likeness of the father was Shem from Adam, right? But perhaps we're meant to understand that. So a few years back, I think it's something like seven or eight years now, I lost all of my faith in God, completely discarded everything I thought I knew about God. I went through an experience where my faith was shaken to its core, and I just couldn't rely on anything that I hadn't proven for myself. It took me some time to get back to a place where I understood that there was a God. Okay, there there actually is some sort of something out there. And so I began to try to define what it is that, that God was. What are his characteristics? How does he act? How can we relate to him? So on and so forth. And in that process, I began to look through a lot of different religious traditions. I looked through everything from Hinduism to Buddhism, Taoism, New Age, Mormonism. I mean, I looked through this huge list of these different religions from the world, trying to figure out what they had to say about gods and see what I could derive from those to apply to the nature of God. And as I looked through them, I began to notice that there are similarities in all of these different religions. 
Every single one of them has little pieces that overlap with the other, including Christianity. And I began to realize that when I saw those similarities between these various traditions, I was finding truth. Because the best lies contain an element of truth, right? The best lie in the world is 99% true. And so I began to see the similarities between all these different religious traditions. And as I considered and as I really thought about what that meant, God really laid it on my heart that when you find the similarities, you have found a truth, something that is true. But if you want to find the truth, you have to begin looking at the differences, and comparing and contrasting those ways in which they're each different from each other. That is a very useful skill, and it's something that we can apply here as we look through this chapter. Those differences. It says in Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, this whole thing about images, about the son being brought forth in the image of the father. And then it just goes through this whole list of sons being brought forth in the image of the father, making a few side comments about, for example, Enoch, Noah, just some side comments, a little something that we're supposed to look at and perhaps gain something from. I'm not really sure what we can gain from Enoch that's useful, other than that it is possible for a person to leave this world and not die. It's something that we see later in Second Kings, when Elijah is taken up in a whirlwind. I think that's all we can really take from that. Noah, we're going to get an entire five weeks on Noah and his family. And so we'll really dig into Noah and what he means. So for now, let's kind of just stay here in Genesis 5. This picture of the image passing on from God to Adam and from Adam to Seth. And then it's missing. And I think that missing piece is to kind of clue us in that it is actually there. It's as we look through it, we see the line, the image from God to Adam to his sons passing from one generation to the next, all the way down to Noah. As we consider that, let's look back to what we just read in Genesis 4. We have the story of Cain and Abel, and then after that story ends, it then enters into a discussion of Cain's children, his offspring, those created in Cain's image. And what was it that those created in Cain's image did. Well, Cain himself was supposed to be a wanderer, but rather than wandering, he founded a city. Rather than filling the earth, he congregated into that city place. His children developed metallurgy, entertainment. Uh, entertainment itself isn't bad, but it is useful for drawing one's attention away from the things that are important. Then they created weapons of war. They began to industrialize killing. I mean, let's just leave it at that. They began to industrialize killing. Cain killed his brother, and over the generations, they turned it into an industry. They made it something that was celebrated. Let's look to our entertainment today. What is it that's celebrated? It's that killing. It's that industrialized killing on large scales. So rather than Cain's maybe unintentional murder of his brother, Lemech, the fullness of Cain's line, intentionally and personally had someone killed for his slightest offense. But we know from later in scripture that the realm of vengeance belongs to God himself, not to men. But Lemech was the one who took that vengeance upon himself. So Cain produced offspring in his own image, the seed after his kind to use another phrase from Genesis 1. Another subtle clue to this is in Genesis 4, verse 1, it was Eve who bore a son. Cain and Abel are never really described as Adam's son, other than Adam knew his wife Eve, and she bore a son. And then Adam's gone from the thing. It is Eve who bears it. It's Eve who names the children. And she was the one who, in Genesis 3, gave in to the temptation in the garden. It's almost as if it's saying that Cain was in Eve's image. I'm not trying to make any kind of claim about women being lesser than men or more evil than men or anything like that. It's just the imagery that the Bible itself provides. It's something that Paul talks about, how Eve was the one who gave in. 
he's not trying to say that women are all evil or more easily tempted or anything like that. Don't hear that in any place in the Bible. It's just following that natural metaphor that's carrying that image out to its fullest conclusion. Oh, here we go. Timothy 2, 13 through 14. It says it, because Adam was foreign first and then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman, having been deceived, fell into transgression. He's not passing blame. He's not trying to say, oh, that evil woman, she's the reason that Adam fell. No, God makes it very clear. Adam's responsible for his own choices. Eve is responsible for her choices. But we get this picture of Eve as the one who was tempted and succumbed to the temptation. Passed on to Cain, who was tempted. Succumbed to the temptation. Who then passed it on to all of his children until we get to Lemech. And Lemech is tempted to take multiple wives. Lemech is tempted to kill people for nothing at all. In fact, if you look at the words used for what those men did to Lemech, it's bruising. It's a slight, they scratched me, I'm going to kill them. So in chapter 5, Seth is identified as the son, the image of Adam, who was the image of God. And then Genesis 5 follows that from generation to generation of the seed of the kind after the father. Created in God's image, created in Adam's image, not created in Eve's image. Because Eve's image was the one of deception and sin. And then we read of the true line of image bearers, as true as a human possibly can be, going on from generation to generation. And at the end of that, there was only one who was righteous in his generations, in his history, in his lineage, in his upbringing, and that's Noah. He was the only one left of that line of God passed through men, of the image of God being modeled out into the world. And so as we consider that, we have to realize we all produce fruit into the world. We all produce fruit in someone's image. My son is being brought up in the image of Aaron Bishop. Actually, in the image of Aaron and my wife. The way that we deal with situations, the way we react to stress, the way we operate in our relationship with each other, the things we care for, the tastes of foods that we prefer, a family traditions, and more will be modeled in him as he grows. They'll morph slightly as he becomes his own person, as he grows into his own understanding of the world, but they're all going to be based on that initial re-imaging of myself and my wife in him. And so as we come into contact with the world, we begin to sow seed as well. We plant seeds in others of the image that we operate in. And I think that's one of the way that generational curses is something you'll hear about in Christian circles. The generational curse. I think that's one of the ways that that operates. Because an abusive parent produces abusive children. Argumentative parents produce argumentative children. Alcoholic parents produce alcoholic children. We all, in some way, are a model of our parents into the world. We model our society when we enter into other societies. We model our culture when we mix cultures. We truly are reflections of our surroundings. And that should truly sober us all. We should really, really stop and consider ourselves. Because if you're a believer in Messiah, you are the body, the shadow, and the image of Messiah to the world. Every moment of the day, we're to be reflecting his image to the world. Not our image, not our society's image, not our parents' image, not the entertainment that we take in image, but his image. We are creating an image in ourselves, something that the ways that we act, we are building that image. But we have to be sure that it's his image that we're acting in. In order to break these generational curses, the curses of alcoholism, abusiveness, so on and so forth, we have to allow ourselves to be changed. We have to stop allowing history to control us. We have to stop allowing our society to control us, to make our decisions for us. The ways that we have been hurt and those who are responsible for that hurt have to be forgiven. The image can't be fully realized until that happens. 
So we can do this in multiple ways. We can change ourselves into whatever image we prefer. We can begin to define for ourselves good and evil and then choose an image that we want to be and then work towards that image. That's what most sports stars do, right? You choose, I want to be a basketball player. And so you go out into the world and you begin to act in that image, shooting hoops, running, jumping, buying Nikes, whatever. And you begin to project that image out into the world and you begin to operate and live that image in your life. What you want to be, because that person has defined basketball player as good. Or we can die to ourselves. We can die to our world. We can die to our past. And then we can allow our image to be molded and shaped into the image of our Messiah who died on our behalf. Ah, That's pretty good, right? Right? Genesis 5. Who knew there was so much in there? So what does Genesis 6 verses 1 through 8 have to add to this? What does it add to this whole story of bearing the image, of creating the image, of operating in the image around you. So let's flip the page, and as we read the text, we find out that it takes a hard left into wacky country. (laughs) These particular set of verses have led to such an abundance of speculation and sensationalism, and I am not going to add my voice to the number of Nephilim chasers out there. There are, however, clues that we can look to and discover in this text, and we can understand what is actually being represented here in the text. So one phrase that we could look to is the sons of God, and that's a phrase that's used in other places in Scripture. And as you look through scholarly sources, there's multiple ways of looking at and reading that and understanding what that could mean. So we've got the option of sons of God could mean heavenly creatures, such as is used in Job 1, 6, and 2, 1. Angelic beings, if you will. The divine counsel. Another option is one that is popular among many in the more scholarly areas of Hebrew roots, and that is one that is, in the ancient world, kings viewed themselves as sons of the gods. Pharaoh was seen as the embodiment of Osiris. Caesar was seen in the Greek world, had himself declared as God on earth. And even in 2 Samuel chapter 7, we see Hashem says that he will raise up David's seed as a son. We even see in Exodus 4.22 that Israel as a nation is called God's son, the son of God, right? So the sons of God could refer to kings who took commoners for mates. All right, that's two possibilities. There's a third option as well. So that it could be that the sons of God are the line that was just described in Genesis 5, that image that's being carried through the generations, and it's that these sons of God chose for themselves the daughters of men, people from the line of Cain. And so this holy, perfect, and pure line then intermarried with this defunct line of death, the line of the world, idol worshippers and such. And again, in scripture, we see this idea also reflected in the commands that Israel shouldn't take wives from the nations. In Ezra, they actually divorce their wives and send away children from those wives because those wives were idol worshippers. And again, it's another idea we can see all through scripture. All three of those are something that we can see reflected in scripture. So which is it? Does it matter? Does it affect you? Hmm. That's the question I have when we start to argue over who are the sons of God and who are the daughters of men in this chapter. How does your chosen solution to this conundrum advance the cause of the kingdom of God? Does it bring life? Is that what we're supposed to focus on in this section? Trying to define this. The truth is that all three of those options do conform to various patterns in Scripture. So, eh, which one's right? I don't know. I really don't know. And frankly, I don't care. However, we do find a pattern here. A pattern that is useful. Something that we can learn from. And again, we're looking back to that pattern from Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. That pattern of seeing something, defining as good, and then taking for yourself. 
because Genesis 6-2 contains all those same words. It's something we saw in Genesis 4. So it's a pattern of temptation, right? So what does that tell us? There's this pattern of temptation going on here. Who's being tempted? I don't know. What are they being tempted with? Daughters of men. If we understand it, though, as a pattern of temptation, we can understand that those daughters of men were not something that those sons of God were supposed to have. Whoever the sons of God are, they're just succumbing to this temptation. They're seeing something beautiful. They're defining it as good, and they're taking it to themselves. The women that they chose, the daughters of men, were outside of the scope of what God had allowed for them. It's the same as Eve in the garden. There was a place that was outside of the scope of what was theirs. They had every other tree, but there was one tree that was outside of the scope, outside of what was good for them, what was life for them. And she took it. And then Cain, he had the option to do right by his brother, to allow God to define good and evil, rather than to try to define it on his own terms. But then he took something from God, the realm of death, and he applied it to his brother. And these sons of God, they took something that was outside of the realm of what God had for them. Let's leave it at that. We, too much speculation, I think, when we start trying to define who they were. I don't think that's the point of the verse. I don't think that's the point of this whole section. But there is a result there's a result to this temptation. There's something that comes from it. And what is that? What is the fruit of this union? The Nephilim. Oh boy. <laughs> what surprises me so much is how much airtime Nephilim get on YouTube and through other teachers. When it's a word that appears only three times in scripture and in only two verses. This verse here, and in Numbers 13.33, the only two times in all of Scripture you will find the word Nephilim. Why do we spend so much time on it? Because it's sensational. And we love sensation, don't we? I mean, you're all going to see Avengers, aren't you? It's sensational. We love it. We eat it up. Mmm, tasty. However, that verse in Numbers 13.33 connects the Nephilim to another race, the Anakim. And then if we start tracing the path of the Anakim, again, mentioned only like seven times in Scripture, we start to get these other names, the Rephaim, the Zamzumim, the Emim, and so many others, which then opens the scope of, uh, spreads that seed of the Nephilim through the pages of Scripture. It's as if the seed of the Nephilim is being planted here and then kind of filters its way through. So who are these races? Who are the Anakim, the Zamzumim, the Rephaim? Who are they? Each of them is identified as a powerful race, giants, whether that means they were actual like 10 feet tall, 15 feet tall people, or it just means that they were, you know, a head taller than the average short Israelite, which is somewhere around 5'4". We don't really know. There's a lot of speculation out there, and there's a lot of really bad, deceitful, if you will, articles and images flying around social media trying to prove some things that have not been proven. Images of skulls and skeletons and so on and so forth that have been completely doctored. But each of these powerful races we see later are enemies of God. They are enemies of the natural order. And it's been theorized that these are the races that God was trying to wipe out when he ordered the conquest of Canaan. The Canaanites had intermarried with some of these races and the, so it was trying to wipe out these bloodlines from the Nephilim that had come before. Mm, we don't know that. We do know that the Edomites faced off against some of these guys. In Deuteronomy early on, we read of the Edomites facing off against the Emim and that they had to cleanse them from the land of Sair that they entered into. But regardless, let's just use them right now as a placeholder for enemies who brought death. Because what are they described as? Men of valor, strong men, mighty men, warriors. They were men who brought death. And that, I think, kind of gets us to something that we can sink our teeth into. 
Because what was it we saw back in Genesis 4? The temptation, the living out that image of the father, or in this case, the mother, being one that brings death, living in an image other than God's, which is then carried from generation to generation on until that death is immortalized and industrialized, seen on a large scale. And then here in chapter 6, we see the same thing. These sons of God marry daughters of men. They bear Nephilim. And those Nephilim are also men who have industrialized to death. But right there in the center, in the middle, is a race where not a single person is a mighty man of valor, not a single person's hunter or killer. They are men, generation after generation, who carry on the image of God. From one generation to the next. They operate as fully as they can in the image that God gave man through Adam. Hmm. So this entire section from chapter 4, verse 16 through chapter 8 is a discussion of the seed of men. Kind producing after kind. You can be in the image of your father, if you like. That's what it's kind of posing to us. You can be in the image of your society. You can be in the image of beast or man. But without being in the image of God, whatever you become is in the image of something that's opposed to God. There's only one image man was created to model into the world. And that's the image of God. Being any other image results in what we read in chapter 6, verse 5. Wickedness increasing. The inclination of our hearts being continually evil. And that's the danger that we face when we begin to define good as Eve did. When we begin to act in the ways that we see as good as Cain did. When we begin to take those things that are outside of our realm of what God has bestowed on us and take them into ourselves because we have defined them as good. We begin to define good, we only end in evil. We end up with evil. And the result of that is violence, and the result is wickedness. It's death. And that, that results in judgment. Now, when it comes to judgment, there are usually two thoughts on judgment. Either We hate judgment. We don't want our hearts to be judged. We don't want anyone prying into our lives, our motives, our actions, and declaring the nature that is found in those. Or on the other hand, we love judgment because it means that all those creeps and evil cretins out in the world are going to get theirs. The wicked are going to get what's coming to them. Both are short-sighted and incomplete thoughts. Judgment isn't something that should be feared by the people of God, but neither is it something that should be welcomed by the people of God. We'll talk more on that. What we will talk about today is that there is a way to escape the judgment that is due mankind for following after these other images, whether they be men or beast, or even... Sons of God. Because there's only one image that man was created to reflect. One image only. We are made to reflect the image of the one true God, the God of creation, the God of life. All of us, every single person on earth, if you draw a breath, that is your calling. To model the God of life into the world. But we are in the image of our father Adam when we're born. We bear that image of death within us. We bear that image very close to our skin. Because we seek to engage in death. We seek to spread death. We are, in fact, creatures of death since we began defining good and evil on our own. One thing that we will find as we continue on is that God only defines something as good once it's reached its potential to support life. Let's go back to Genesis 1. 
God defines things as good, right? We talked about that in lesson one. Defines as good seven times in that chapter. One of those times, very good. When did he define each of those things as good? When they had been completed. He didn't define as good until it was all said and done in that instance. We see that in Genesis 1. That's pretty clear. But let's look at the end of Genesis, the story of Joseph. Some very terrible things happened to Joseph in his life. Things we would call evil. Things that man intended for evil. But it's not until the very end of Joseph's story that it's actually defined as good. All of it. Everything he went through, all the hardship, all the heartache, all the trials and temptations, all the false accusations, all of it was good in the end. The process was good because of where it ended. Hmm. There was something in Genesis 2 that was called not good. Loneliness. Being outside of community. It's impossible to bring life, to live in the way of life, without community. It's not good that man should be alone. Not good that man should be alone. Man needs people around him. We need mate. We need community. We need fellowship. It's only in fellowship. It's only in that community that we can find life. There's only one way to escape judgment. To reach that point of good. And that is to find grace in the eyes of God. And that's where this Parsha ends. It ends with that last man in the line of Adam, in the line of the image of God. That man, Noah, who found grace, chen, in the eyes of God. Grace first. But we'll see next week that instruction is next. If Noah had found grace, but then had not obeyed the instruction, would he have survived the flood? No. Grace is not enough to cut it. Grace is the first step. Hmm. I'm not even sure we accurately define grace. And that's something that we may get into later. So grace is given. Then instruction. And that's something we see model and model over and over again. And it's something that we can recognize back in Genesis 2. There was grace in the act of creation. Grace in the act of finding a mate for man. I didn't have to do that. But without it, there would not be life. And then, after the grace was found, instructions were given. Don't eat from the tree. Well, here, in the case of Noah, after the grace was found, instructions are given. Build a boat. Obedience. Obedience forestalls judgment. And that continues over and over through Scripture. Grace is given, and then there's a response. A response of obedience. God didn't redeem Israel in Exodus from Egypt by imposing a bunch of rules on them. He gave them grace. He gave them a means of grace, the sacrificed lamb. Then he led them through the wilderness. Then he gave them his instruction. And when they broke it, and they did, he gave them grace again by reconstituting the covenant. And when they broke it, and they did, he extended grace again by reconstituting the covenant. It's a cycle that continues over and over continually through Scripture. But that's something that we'll get into a lot more deeper next week. For now, I think we should just consider the image that we ourselves are living in. And there is an image that is the image of God, an image that we can use to emulate in this world. And it's an image that is the narrow path. It's the path between death and death. And it's the path of life. The death of Cain and the death of the sons of God. It's the path of Adam on through Noah. And this is an image that we're all called to participate in. If you are a believer in Yeshua, you are called to participate in this image, to live this image. And it's this image that Paul is referring to in Ephesians chapter 4. 
it's Paul looking back on the whole scope of the scriptures, the scriptures that he had, what we called the Old Testament, and then expounding upon those scriptures with his current understanding and knowledge of Yeshua and who he is. I hope that going through this, these last four weeks, I hope that this has demonstrated to you just how powerful using these tools in your scripture study can really be. Because life itself contains patterns, and so too, scripture contains patterns on many levels. Discerning and comparing the parts of these patterns are what can lead us and help us to gain a deeper understanding of the Word of God. We should not sit and simply read straight through the Bible from one end to the other. We gain really only a very surface level understanding when we do that. The true depth of understanding comes with sitting in the text and acting like Sherlock Holmes. It comes with sitting in with the text and being aware of what it says. Asking questions to the text. Figuring out what it's trying to affirm rather than trying to figure out what's sensational and the things that don't matter. Many times what's going on in the text will be things that we don't want to focus on. We want to focus on the characters. We want to focus on the sons of God. We want to focus on the Nephilim. But that's not the most important thing in this chapter. That's not the thing of life in this chapter. And so Genesis 5 is not here simply for the purpose of highlighting a man who didn't die or connecting the dots between Adam and Noah. It does those things, but that's not the point of it. Uh, and Genesis 6, 1 through 8 isn't focusing on the Nephilim or the sons of God. They are simply the players that are used to examine this much deeper concept of carrying on the seed. What image are you putting out in the world? Of making that a larger image of who is your father. Is your father your earthly father? Adam. Whatever your earthly father's name is. Or is your father your heavenly father? How do you know? Well, by your love for one another, they will know. By your fruits, they will know. That's how we know. This is the culmination of the comparison in these chapters. And it's something that we should all think on and consider as we proceed through this experiment and as we proceed through our own lives. The way of life will be the way that Messiah modeled for us. And he's the one that we should always look to for guidance. So in the next episode, we will begin the Noah cycle. It's a five-part series that goes through a cycle. It starts with judgment, goes to new creation, and then ends in judgment again. And it's a cycle that we see repeating through Scripture over and over again. And as we look at it, we'll recognize that judgment isn't the place where the cycle starts. But it is kind of the bookends. It's a little complicated now, but we'll get into it, and hopefully I'll be able to break it down in a way that you'll be able to understand. So I pray that this has blessed you. I pray that this has helped you to see scripture in a new light to be able to crack its pages and understand more of what it's saying. And I pray that as you go forward, as you do all that you do, I pray that you always and in every way, Darish Chai, seek life. Shalom. Thank you for tuning in to Darish Chai. If you would like to find out more or support this ministry, head over to seeklifesc.com. That's seeklifesc.com. We'll see you again next time as we dare Chai, as we seek life. Shalom.